can I get involved? How can I throw in? That God is a punishing God and not a loving God. So when He did, has done, will be, and already has been accomplished. I am the resurrection. Good evening. Oh, it seems like really bright in here. <laughs> have you guys need the air conditioner on? No, you don't have to turn it down. Is, is anybody in here? Do you need the air conditioner on? Yeah, yeah. Morgan. <laughs> so I want to welcome our guests. We have two guests here for the first time. Three. She's already a doctor. Yeah, they're already part of the family and even the bus. How soon not easy to get rid of? In 20 years. <laughs> yep. Wow. You gotta make sure everybody's awake. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just thank you for this evening, Lord. I thank you for the honor and privilege of us being able to be here, Heavenly Father, to hear your word, Lord. I know that this message is for me first, Lord. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace and mercy that's in every day. I thank you for the people that are here for the first time, Lord. I just pray that we can make them feel like family, Heavenly Father. Lord, I just praise you, Heavenly Father, for all that you've done and continue doing in our lives, Lord. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, above all, Lord, that you give us your word, you give us your truth, Heavenly Father. Lord, that we might not be ignorant of the ways of the devil, but that we might be prepared for whatever storms might come, Lord. So I just surrender my lips to you, Heavenly Father. I pray that you touch the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus. The enemy is a liar. Yes, he is. You know, the only thing he has is doubt. He has doubt, and uh, many times he'll come to us with that doubt. Mm. And he did to me a minute ago. I had to get on my knees and, and surrender myself to the Lord because this is not an easy, an easy, uh, an easy message. But, you know, as, as shepherds, and I am here under the authority of my husband, which is the shepherd of this congregation. But as shepherds, we are to sound the alarm when the wolves are circling our sheep. Yeah. And, and, you know, if we wouldn't do that, then it would be a disservice to you guys. So, um, and I really pray that this is, this is not, it's not going to be an easy message to take in, but I know that the Holy Spirit will help you to dissect it and, and to understand it and, and to really ponder in your heart how short time is. Yeah. How many in here by a raising of hands have ever hit the snooze button on your alarm clock? Everybody. <laughs> Mr. Mrs. Gonzalez had a perfect painter. <laughs> wow, congratulations. You know, it, it's funny because you hit the snooze button on your alarm clock or on your phone, and, and you think, I'm just going to sleep for five more minutes. And then you wake up, and 45 minutes have gone by, and you're rushing, trying to get to work, right? It's funny because it happened to me this morning. I set my alarm clock for 5 a.m. past your work graveyard last night, but I'm an early person anyway. I like to go outside and, and just breathe the morning air and see the stars that are still in the sky. So I put my alarm for 4.55 and 5. So my alarm clock rang at 4.55 and I hit the snooze button and I got well, it'll ring again at 5. I didn't hear the alarm at 5. <laughs> I woke up and it was like 15 till 6. I'm like jumping out of the bed. I'm like, where did the, those five minutes go? It was so fast. But you know, that's how life is. The Bible says that life is but a vapor. We're here for a short time and then we're gone. But what we do in between for the Lord is what really counts. Because we'll stand before Him and we'll give account for that short time we're here. 
You know, my, my niece got engaged last year, and uh, she went to New York City and bought her wedding dress, and just all excited for the wedding and everything. Well, three weeks ago, her baby girl was born. Little baby Mia was born. And um, on Sunday morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang. And it's happened to me so many times, I knew it wasn't good news. And my phone rang exactly 4 a.m. I remember picking up and I looked at the, my phone and it was 4 a.m. And it was my sister asking me if I knew what had happened. My niece's fiance has a 12-year-old daughter. She's 10 or 12. Uh, that evening, early in the day, she called and said, Daddy, can I go and meet Mia Rose? Because my, my niece had been on quarantine after having the baby. So she said, I really want to go meet my little stepsister. Will you pick me up? So he went and picked her up and she spent time with the baby and they took pictures and just so excited to meet her little sister. And, and so it was getting a little bit late, they ate dinner and then he had to take her home. And um, so he went and he dropped her off and only a couple of minutes later, he was crossing Central, there was two cars racing. The police said they were going probably like 95 to 100 miles an hour. He was at a stop sign. It was his time to go, but they were coming so fast he didn't see them, and I guess they weren't able to stop. He was killed instantly. The car was chopped in half. He was killed instantly. My niece was at home waiting for him with a cup of soup that he had asked her to prepare. And when he didn't come, she wondered if maybe he had got a flat tire or something. And didn't know anything until the police called her. They went to her house and, and notified her that know what had happened. But that's how short life is. Mm. You know, sometimes we think, oh, we're just going to run to the store. We're just going to run to the gas station. And we'll be right back. We're just going to go to this a small errand. And he was just going to drop off his daughter. He was going to go back and have his cup of soup and they were going to call it a night. Well, now my niece is left raising a three-week-old little baby by herself. Her daddy will never see her first day of school. He'll never be there to interview her boyfriends and see which one's good enough for her. He'll never be able to walk her down the aisle. He won't be there when she breaks her first tooth and when she takes her first step. Because life's not fair sometimes. But the Bible doesn't promise us that life will be fair. It says that life is but a vapor. And every day we should get up and purpose to live for the Lord. Because we don't know that quick run to the grocery store, we might not come home. One of my best friends years ago got home from work on a Saturday, was going to get ready to go to a wedding. Real life, she was on hairspray. Was going to run to Walmart, which was only like three blocks away, to get hairspray. Told her mom to watch the baby, she'd be right back. A drunk driver was coming on the wrong side of the road and hit her car head on. That car, the steering wheel chopped her in half. And another life was taken, and that little boy was raised without a mom. We have to realize how fragile our lives can be. Sometimes we don't realize how we get up, and I don't know about you guys, but I get up in the morning, this is like what my list looks like for the to-do today list. <clears throat> and sometimes I wonder if I'll finish everything on my list for that day. We take it for granted sometimes. The person sitting next to you that you love and you care about, sometimes we take them for granted. Sometimes we forget to say I love you. Sometimes we forget to say thank you and I appreciate you. The last words that my niece spoke to her fiance, well, hurry up. I'm not going to keep your soup warm all night. Knowing that 
that soup was going to sit there all night and maybe the next day. I want to let you guys know something that Pastor and I found out <clears throat> yesterday. Yesterday, right? Well, on Sunday, June 21st, this coming Sunday is Father's Day. <clears throat> and on Sunday, June 21st, there's going to be a Lucifer march for a one world government. All the devil worshipers are going to get together in certain cities and they're going to do a march for a one world government. If you go to their website, the ones who have, have um, gone on Facebook and mentioned that they, they will be there. You know what their theme is? Hashtag the rapture day. Hashtag the rapture day. And these people serve Satan. But I think they think in their minds that there's going to be a rapture and that Satan's going to take them to heaven, I guess. I don't know what they're thinking. Because I don't think the devil worshippers should be so excited about the rapture day. That's not a day. That's not a day for them to be very excited about, let me tell you. But anyway, on Father's Day, on Father's Day between 2 p.m. and 11 p.m. Pacific time, they will be marching on the evening of the solar eclipse that is called the Ring of Fire. Many cities throughout the United States will have their streets flooded with Satan worshipers. Some of the cities involved in this march are Jacksonville, Florida. I'm going to mention these names, these cities, so if you have family living there, you guys need to give them a heads up that this Sunday they really need to be in fasting and prayer. Not only them for their cities, all of us need to be in fasting and prayer on Sunday for, for this, but especially for them. So a lot of the places that were mentioned are Jacksonville, Florida, Raleigh, North Carolina, Cincinnati, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, Washington, D.C., Madison, Wisconsin, Los Angeles, California, Buffalo, New York, Seacrest, New York, Albany, New York, Niagara Falls, New York, Salem, Oregon, Boston, Massachusetts, Toronto, Ontario, Las Vegas, Nevada, and maybe even New Mexico in Santa Fe because they have participated in the past, but because of the coronavirus, they're not sure if they're going to do it in Santa Fe this year. They say that some demonstrators may try to erect satanic monuments at the existing sites where the Confederate and other allegedly racist statues have been torn down. Isn't it amazing that these, these riots have started and they want all these statues taken down? But this has already been planned for months to put satanic statues where the other monuments are coming down. You know, it's just amazing that the reason I, I put this message, I titled it Five Minutes, is because a long time ago the church hit the snooze button. Mm. And we're still asleep. Mom. It's time to wake up, you guys, because these things are really happening. You know, I know Father's Day is Sunday's Father's Day, and you know, we all do barbecues, and, and we all have people over to eat and stuff. But I'm really going to suggest and recommend to you that maybe on Saturday you can fast and maybe Sunday evening after the barbecue's done. Till 11, midnight, whatever you can, you need to fast and pray for these things that are happening. You know, these are affecting the next generation. All these things that take place, they're going to be there. They're going to be chanting to Satan. They're going to be filling the streets with demons. People don't realize. See, the thing is, a lot of churches don't speak about spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. The only spiritual warfare you hear from some churches sometimes is as far as the book of Ephesians, the armor of God. Put it on so you can protect yourself. But we have 
to realize, you guys, that there's wolves out there that want our children. And they're doing a pretty good job of dragging our children into addictions, into suicide, and into hell. We need to be vigilant. Us, as a church, we need to be vigilant. And we need to let the people know that it's time to get serious. It really is time to get serious about these things. The United States of America, since the late 1950s, we have been asleep. Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez, I'm sure you can remember that in the 1950s, that's the last time that God moved on a large scale in our country, except for a little blip here or there on the radar, on the radar and the screen of revival. We call the Jesus, the Jesus movement of the 1950s is when the Jesus movement really began, and it ended in the 60s. But in the 50s were the post-World War II days. The economy was good, patriotism was high, Billy Graham began to fill the stadiums as he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Southern Baptists were aggressive soul winners. We didn't have to worry about moderates or liberals. We were focused on winning. The theme for that day in the 50s was a million more by 54. And they did it. They were able to reach over a million people to the gospel of Jesus Christ in 1954. But towards the end of this great decade, the churches across this land said, in effect, we have worked long and hard. Let's take a rest. And when God's people went to sleep, the devil began to crawl and ravage our land. The 1960s were the most turbulent years of our nation's history. They expelled God from our churches, from our schools, prayer and the Bible from public schools. The hippies ushered in the drug culture. We were sending our boys to the rice paddies of a little country called Vietnam. The Beatles brought in the modern rock and roll to our shores. Radical violence, violence rocked the inner cities. The three tragic assassinations of John F. Kennedy in 1963, Bobby Kennedy in 1968, and Martin Luther King in 1968 sent our nation into a tailspin. As we continue to sleep as the church in the 1970s dawned, with them radical feminist movement emerged. The Supreme Court decided that unborn babies have no rights and abortion was legalized on demand. Despite the moral decay and corruption of our nation, the churches hit the snooze button. They turned over in bed and they pulled the covers over their head and continued to sleep. Then came the 1980s, the New Age movement. Hmm. There was widespread interest in the occult, witchcraft, Satanists abound. As America studied their horoscope, the churches were rocked by the moral failures of Jim Baker and Jimmy Swigert. Crack cocaine polluted our cities, pornography polluted our minds, and gangs ravaged our streets of the inner cities. But the church still refused to wake up. See, I think when, when the Lord tells us in the Bible that we should go into our prayer closet to pray in secret, I think sometime somebody went into the prayer closet and they fell asleep. You know? I think the church went into the prayer closet and they fell asleep instead of getting to their knees to pray. You know, because sometimes we feel like we've had a hard week at work. We've had a hard week in the ministry and we deserve to have a day off. We're at the end of the battle, guys. The Lord's coming soon. We can't afford a day off. We have to keep our armor on, our eyes open, and our and our source where we can readily grab it. As we entered the 90s, the church, rather than getting out of bed, put a do not disturb sign on the door. A lot of a lot of churches 
begin to become museums for the saints and not hospitals for the sick. Mm. You know, the homeless, the drug addicts, the prostitute, they're not welcome because they're not dressed a certain way, because they don't smell a certain way. Shame on us. Mm. Shame on us. If we were to have a hundred homeless people walk through our door right now, what we do as Christians and followers of Jesus Christ, we get up and we give them our seat. Yeah. And we make them welcome here. Because if you're sick, you go to the hospital. But if you're spiritually backing, this is the best place to be. And the enemy knows that. Why do you think that the churches were the only thing that wasn't essential during this whole thing? Home Depot was essential. Walmart was essential. I understand. We need groceries. We need to fix the leak in the roof. But this is where we come and we fix the void in our heart. Yeah. And the things in our life that don't line up with the Word of God. Because just like my niece's fiance, we might just turn the corner one of these days and not come back home. Are we ready to open our eyes before God and give account for our lives? Mm. Are we ready? That puts fear in me. In the 1990s, we elected a president who was pro-homosexual, placing gays in a prominent position throughout his administration. Mr. Clinton was also pro-abortion. Our Senate and our House have passed that bill that would have banned partial birth abortions. But our President vetoed that bill, staking his hands with the blood of these innocent babies who have been butchered throughout these years. Now we are in a new millennium. Is the church waking up? With everything that's been going on, you guys, with the coronavirus, with social distancing, with going to Walmart and there's APD guarding the toilet paper. Did you ever think that you would see a day, Mr. Gonzalez, where APD would be guarding the toilet paper at Walmart to make sure you just got one pack or one roll? You know what these, the thing is, is that as I was looking through this website because somebody happened to send me information on Messenger. And it was funny because it was the morning that, I can't believe, I, I don't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday, but Pastor was going to work. He was leaving the house about four in the morning. And it was just so weird to see the moon still in the east, still directly over the mountains. And I told him, you know, that's just kind of, that's strange to me. Anyway, later that day, I got this message, and so I began to look into it, and I thought, you know what? Where's the church? For several years, we've had a Jesus parade here in Albuquerque, and very few churches rise up and participate. But you look at these devil worshipers, and they're going to have this march for a one-world government, and it's many cities and hundreds of people. They might be in the wrong faith, but at least they're faithful to what they believe. Mm. And it's kind of sad that they put the modern day church to shame because we should be out there on the streets. We should be out there proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ. In the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 14 through 16, and I'm reading from the New King James Bible, Ephesians 5, verses 14 through 16. And it says, Therefore, he says, the Lord says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Well, are you aware that we're having major problems in the United States of America? 
We're a nation that is divided morally, spiritually, intellectually, and politically. Jesus himself said in Luke 11, 17, any, any kingdom divided against itself is made waste, and a house divided against itself falls. Our churches as a whole have been asleep for over 40 years. It's really time to wake up. I'm not bashing the church because the church is the bride of Christ. I'm just sending out a warning saying, guys, it's time to really take things seriously. Really seriously. You know, what happened with my niece's fiance has really has really made me stop and think, and I think death has a way of doing this. I don't know about you guys, but every time you go to a funeral, you think, man, that person in that coffin could have been me. Or maybe tomorrow would be me. What would people say about me at my funeral? Would there be good said about me? Or would there be people in their hearts rejoicing that, that I'm gone? But it really made me think, and I thought, you know what? Sometimes we get comfortable, and we start taking each other for granted. And we stop saying the thank yous and the I love yous. Because now it's not, it's not just a simple run to the store. It seems like the world's angry. Have you noticed? Have you guys noticed on the freeways? It seems like everybody's angry. And they're taking off their anger on the, on the road or the way that they drive. I can't tell you how many times the Lord has paused me at a green light only for a massive truck or a car to fly by. They pass the red light. And the Lord has saved my life so many times. God desires to send a spiritual awakening. He is sounding an alarm. He is crying out to his people in America saying, it is time to get out of bed. It's really time to get out of bed. It's really time to start finding out, are your neighbors saved? Do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Does your neighbor have a Bible? You know, I was... I was smiling earlier when, when I saw that we had first-timers coming to the church because this morning I was thinking of a really beautiful message, just not, not a candy cane message. We don't do that here, but I, just a beautiful message about the cross. And the Lord kept putting this on my heart. And, I, and, and, and as I saw the first time we walk in a little while ago, I'm thinking, oh gosh, I don't know, I should have brought the other message too. <laughs> this is a little bit too hard. You know, I don't want to scare you guys away. Okay. Trust me, I, I say this with all the love I can muster up because whenever you lose someone in your family, it really makes you think, I know it does me. You know, they open up their eyes. They close their eyes in this life and they open up their eyes in one of two places. Eternal glory or eternal damnation. And it grieves my heart sometimes when I'm not sure. You know, when my mom passed away from cancer, I rejoiced because she knew Jesus, man. She loved Jesus. My mom didn't know how to read or write, but once she heard the word of God, she volunteered for the prison ministry. Amen. And she went to ministry, the prisons, and she made these grown men cry like babies. Wow. Boy, she just laid down the axe and she didn't have it. You know, and, and a lot of men in prison came to the Lord. And you know, by all my mom's life, she was born and raised Catholic. We had a Bible that we had on the little table where she had all the saints and all the candles, and we had a Bible, but you didn't touch that Bible. That was for decoration. Now that we touch that Bible, we knew we were going to be in trouble, you know? And if my mom ever wanted to hide money, I think she hid it in the Bible because nobody touched that Bible. It was like, 
if you touch that Bible, lightning's going to strike you and the ground's going to open up and swallow you. And, and we feared the Bible, but we didn't fear God. And I made a lot of mistakes in my life because I made the mistake of never opening up that Bible. I made the mistake of fearing a spanking and fearing God. And, you know, the Bible says that we perish for a lack of knowledge. And the thing is, concerning this issue here, you're going to walk out that door and you're going to have the knowledge concerning this issue. So there won't be any more excuse. We have to let the world know that time is short. God is saying to our country today, America, you are wicked. America, you are secular. America, you don't pray anymore. America, you have a God we trust on your money. But you've turned your back on me. You know, it's amazing how, how all of our dollar bills say, God, we trust. And only 2% of the church in whole tithes, only 2% of the church as a whole gives back to God what belongs to God. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says that no thief will enter into the gates of heaven. So if you're robbing God, I don't think there's any greater thief than that. Romans 13, 11 through 14. Romans 13, 11 through 14. The word of the Lord says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill it's lust. You know, I used to struggle with road rage. Big time. <laughs> I used to struggle with it big time. And I remember one time, some lady cut me off, and man, I was going after her, weaving in and out of traffic, and she knew I was going after her. She was trying to get away from me. And I finally passed her and I honked and I gave her that one finger wave. This was BC, okay? And, you know, Thank just, you just, that up. just the one finger hello. You know, my car's faster than yours. Yep. And I was riding my brother's car that said, follow me to church. <laughs> Destination. I got our car. I went to get something out of the trunk. I'm like, oh, follow me to church. I think that day I became a stumbling block to somebody because she was right behind me reading that sign, follow me to church. I never forget it to this day. Mm. You know, our, our actions need to speak louder than our words. They really do. <laughs> Is there times, are there times where I still get frustrated, I still get upset? Yeah, yes. I had a semi-truck almost ram me into the side of the freeway. I had nowhere to go and I thought, man, if he just comes six more inches, that's it. And I was so upset and I'm getting behind him and you know, there's house my driving and there's a big old phone number. So I'm trying to drive and I'm trying to mark that phone number at the same time. And I <clears throat> forgot to watch for the other cars around me. And I'm like, you know, just because I got angry and I'm trying to call that number and say, how is my driving, call 1-800-whatever, I could have killed somebody. 
I could have taken somebody's life. And I'd still be living with that regret to this day. We have to really think about what we do every day on a daily basis, how we act, how we treat people, Amen. our actions. Because you know what? All these things that are happening to you guys, it's not to cause fear in our hearts because this is prophecy. This is prophecy. Things, these things are going to happen. The Bible says that in the, in the last days, that evil is going to be more prevalent. That there's going to be lawlessness. That parents will be killing children and children will be killing parents. And there will be no respect for life. And, and it's happening, but it's prophecy. It's going to happen. So we don't have to have fear. But what we need to do is we need to check our hearts and we need to make sure that we are prepared to meet our Creator. Is it today? On our way home? Is it tomorrow on the way to work? Because on Sunday, on Saturday at 7.40 p.m. was the end for one young man, 36 years old. See, I, we always think, okay, we're going to die in bed when we're 100 years old. We're going to either have cancer or we're going to be sick or just going to die of old age. He never thought that by taking his daughter home, that as soon as he went to cross the street, the two cars were going to be coming at 95 to 100 miles an hour. that he was never going to see his little girl again or his fiance. My niece is left with a wedding dress hanging in the closet with a broken heart and the fear of how she's going to raise her daughter by herself. And all because two very irresponsible, selfish people decided that it was okay to raise on a public The one world government. If you go to the website, the United States website, and you go to put in the United States website how the United States is participating with the UN Agenda 21 2030 mission goals. And this is the mission goal for the for the one world order. But if you go to the website there, it, it paints a really pretty picture. It even has videos, you guys. It says that the cities are going to become communities. There's not going to be any, any rural homes anymore, any agriculture. They're going to close off cities. They're going to be gated cities. They're going to close them off. There's going to be security cameras. You will not be able to leave that certain part. But they're going to give you food because cash will not be accepted anywhere anymore. They're going to give you a card, or you can have a microchip. And with that microchip, you'll be able to go to the local grocery store and buy food. You'll be able to pay for your home because the government's going to give you an allotment every month. And they're going to control everything that you do. So if you get this microchip, you'll be able to go into the grocery stores. Without this microchip, you will not get any medical attention. You will not be able to buy or sell. You will not be able to get your driver's license. But but also they say, you know, this is going to be a good thing because the government is going to support you. It's going to be a cashless society. We're going to give you a card every month and you'll be able to go. And with this, we're going to give you so much money every month. And you're going to be able to pay your bills. You're going to be able to pay your mortgage. You're going to be able, you know, we're going to, this is the way that we're going to control the environment. We're going to control pollution. They don't say they're going to control you, but that's what's going to happen. And you can go on there and you can see all these videos where they say that, you know, everybody's going to share everything and, 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 and they just make it sound really nice and pretty. It's happening now. And it's happening, it's happening now. And it started now with the, the quarantine and the social distancing. They're just trying to prepare your minds for the things that are to come next. But I went into the New World Order, the UN Agenda, 2130 Mission Goals. 
and this is already happening in the UN. And this, these are their goals by 2030, beginning in 2021. We will have a one world government, a one world cashless society, a one world central bank, a one world military, the end of national sovereignty, the end of all privately owned property, the end of the family unit. Depopulation control of the population and growth and population density, mandatory multiple vaccines, universal basic income, a microchip society for purchasing, for travel, for tracking and controlling, but traveling will be closely guarded. Implementation of a social credit system, like exactly like the one that China has right now. Trillions of appliances hooked into a 5G monitoring system. Government raised children, you will not have the right to raise your own children, the government will raise them. Government owned and controlled schools, colleges, and universities. The end of all private transportation, no more owning your own cars, etc. All businesses owned by government corporations, the restriction of non-essential air travel. That's already happening. Human beings concentrated into human settlement zones and cities. The end of irrigation. The end of private farms and raising livestock. They will not give you the option to raise your own food because if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to starve to death. The end of single family homes. They're going to be bunker like, and you will live with other families. Restricted land use that serves human needs. The ban of all natural non synthetic drugs. The end of fossil fuels. And if you go to the website of the New World Order, UN Agenda 21, 20, 30, you can print out a copy of these mission goals. And the United States is in agreement with the UN in implementing these goals in the beginning of 2021. All this might sound really scary, But the thing is, is we have to remember, as followers of Jesus Christ, everything was paid for us at the cross. Yeah. It was paid in full. It was paid in full. We might be persecuted. We might be shunned. We don't know what's going to happen. They might take our Bibles away. If you notice on this list, churches no longer exist. This is reality, guys. Tell me in your lifetime when you've ever seen anything like what's happened recently with the coronavirus. With the way the government was immediately able to control the population, to hide in their homes, to control the food and the paper goods that you purchased, to control how much money you were able to take out of the bank at one time. All this, with all this is happening, they're just preparing us for what's to come. Mm -hmm. But the good news, the good news is that if you read the end of the Bible, we already win. Mm -hmm. Amen. We won. We won when Jesus took our place on that cross. We won when he left everything he had, every drop of blood. And when he cried, it is finished. We won. We have that hope. But we need to begin to purpose in our minds from now that no matter what happens, we're not going to bend a knee to the government. We're not going to bend a knee to Satan. 
We're only going to bend a knee to our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Amen. And whether the world thinks that they will or not, they will. Because the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. And they're going to confess it on the way to heaven or they're going to confess it on the way to hell. But He is Lord. Yes. He is Lord. The Bible says that heaven is the throne of God and the earth is His footstool. And those who reject and deny Jesus Christ, let me tell you, they're going to be trampled under the foot of Almighty God. Especially those who mock His grace. Mm. You know, sometimes when the Lord has me bring some of these messages that are they're, they're hard. They're hard and I pray for the Holy Spirit to touch your hearts because it's not for me to convince you to believe yeah. the message that the Lord gave me. And it's not for us as pastors to tell you that, you know, we're gonna we're gonna make a surprise visit to your house and you better be living the way that, you know. We think you should live. No. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to come up here in the name of the Lord and to ring the warning bell that these are the last days. These are like the last five minutes. There's no more hitting the snooze button. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. And that's what we're doing with love. With all the love that I can muster up, I'm letting you know that there's no more time to hit the snooze button. You know what's amazing? To me, that when the night that Jesus was arrested, that he was up on the Mount of Olives and he was praying to his father. And it says that he was he was in so much agony that his sweat became like droplets of blood. And his closest friends were asleep. And he went and said, Could you not watch with me for one hour? Could you not watch and pray? Can you imagine? You're about to give your life for somebody. And you have that agony that, you know what? He was all God, but he was all flesh. He was 33 years old. Who wants to die at 33? And he went to his friends and said, could you not watch with me for one hour? One hour. I'm not even asking you for the day, for one hour. I truly believe in my heart that that's what God is asking us right now. Can you not watch and pray for one hour? If we even have that much time left. One hour. We're in the last hour. If you close your eyes for a second, I know that you can imagine somebody that you know that doesn't know Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility, the Bible says, because it says that those who are lost in the world, that if we don't bring the message to them and we don't tell them about Jesus and they don't accept Jesus and they're down to hell, but their blood will be on our hands. And I want to stand before Almighty God, and look down and see that there's blood on my hands. You know, we have to be grateful for these messages. Because it's really made me think, man, what if tomorrow, you know, we think, well, okay, Jesus is coming soon, but what if Jesus comes for me tomorrow? What if Jesus comes for me tonight? What if tomorrow I don't wake up? What footprint did I leave on the earth? What footprint did I leave on your hearts? Will you even remember the messages that we spoke? We all as individuals really need to search our hearts. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez have been married for 60 years. And for 60 years, he's been responsible to provide for her, to love her, to care for her. But when she's standing before God, she's on her own. It's Mrs. Gonzalez and God. 
You know, Mr. Gonzalez has been a convoy all his life, but he can't ride in on that white horse and rescue her. You know, we live this earth, this is done. My husband can't speak for me. We're all going to be accountable for ourselves. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. But the beautiful thing about this message is this message is love. This message is love because God's warning us. He's not leaving us ignorant of the time. He's not leaving us ignorant to the fact that the enemy knows that he has a short time. So he's come down to the earth with such a rage. Why does he hate us? Because we're made in the image of God. Mm. We're made in the image of God. And that you know when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're covered by the blood of Jesus. And that's not a promise that you're not going to suffer persecution because you know why? If you study the wolves of the wild, you know how they do most of their hunting? They follow the scent of blood. If there's an animal that's wounded in the forest, they'll smell it. And they know that it's down or they know that it's weak and they'll go attack. That's exactly how the enemy is with us. The ones that he has in the world, he has them in his back pocket. He's not after them. But you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and every demon in hell is going to sniff you out. Mm. Trouble's going to come. But God gives us the strength through, through his word to overcome anything that the enemy can throw at us. So as I begin to close, I just really want you guys I know Sunday's Father's Day, and I know we have barbecues, and we know I know we have all this, but I'm really going to ask you guys with all of my heart concerning the situation we just talked about. That maybe you can fast on Saturday. I'm going to fast on Saturday. If you want to fast on Sunday, you can fast on Sunday. If you want to have your barbecue in the morning and the afternoon, and then maybe after 1 or 2 p.m., you can fast the rest of the night. Fast and pray. Because as these marches take place and they're going through the streets and there's demons being released, the sin of addictions, mm -hmm. sexual perversion, all of this is going to be going into the homes of the people. You can't march for Satan down the street and have a parade for Satan and think that it's not going to have an effect on a lot of innocent lives. So I'm asking you with all of my heart to join me in pastor and fasting on Saturday and Sunday evening. They're going to be marching until 11 p.m. I'm asking if you'll fast with me till midnight and pray. Really pray with us. Because we know we're in the last days. And we know what? We know that we win. We know that Jesus, one of these days, you know what? <laughs> An angel's going to shout out to him and say, My Lord, the harvest is ready. Cast your sickle into the earth and reap. And in an instant we're going to be gone, but it's not going to be without persecution first. So the more that we begin to get in fasting and prayer, the stronger we're going to be for that day to come. And I've purposed in my mind. I've purposed in my mind and I purpose every day and I pray for God to give me the strength. That the day they kneel me down and they tell me to deny my Lord or I'm going to lose my life, I ask God, I'm playing it over and over in my mind already that I will not deny my Lord. That he will give me the strength to stand. But we become homeless because if you don't get the mark of the beast, you will not eat, you will not buy, you will not sell, you will not have a home, nothing. Jesus. So many things are becoming mandatory already. 
you know, by October 1st, if you don't have a certificate that says that you got the shot, the vaccine for the coronavirus, they're going to deny you your driver's license. It's starting to come, guys. Let's be ready. Let's be ready.